Our next panel, we're going to get our graphic up, is um, on gaming. And, uh, and we have some great people for this. Uh, we have uh, Andrew Shepard, who has been a, a gaming operator, a gaming investor for 20 years. Had a great conversation with him last night um, about his rules, which is, seems to be he's very worried about new ideas. Um, uh, David Nage from ARCA, who is uh, now running their, their new venture fund and is going well. I actually know David's name because uh, his podcast. Um, he's, he's got a pretty big library out there, right? Second, guys. Hold on a second. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> actually, you know, this is Web3. I should be giving you ETH. Yeah, yeah. Or actually. at least a stable coin. Yeah. How much did you um, have? <laughs> yeah. and, and, and Genevieve Theorist. And I, I hate to keep hitting on this point, but like Sam, I was a customer of CityCity.com. And so uh, Genevieve was the founder of City Sitter City. Uh, she's very active in the uh, world of women in tech and diversity in politics. And she also occasionally sings at the Lyric Opera. Wow. <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll let these guys lead it. <laughs> That's amazing. I didn't know that about you. I didn't know that either. Well, now you know. <laughs> yes, there you go. Uh, well, it's a pleasure being with all of you today. Uh, I want to say thank you, uh, especially to Paul and to the Techasonic team. Um, I came from the family office world many years ago, and back in 2018, I took it upon myself to create one of the first family office focused events for digital asset education. Um, my hair, luckily, grew back after a few years. Um, <laughs> and so I, I know that this is one of the hardest thing to do, and especially in a six week time frame. So congratulations to Paul. Thank you for having us, and this has been amazing so far. Okay, so gaming, and what's happening in the world of gaming uh, as it relates to all things Web3. Um, as a quick reference point, Arca was one of the first investors in Axie Infinity um, over two years ago in their private round. For those that don't know Axie Infinity, they were one of the first games that ushered in a, a new terminology called play to earn uh, that has amorphosized into things like play and earn, uh, also things like move and earn, like step in, uh, and another different number of different categories. So we have an amazing panel. We're going to talk all about gaming um, and what we've all seen as investors uh, throughout the last few years as it relates to gaming here. One of the things I want to talk about first and foremost, uh, I'm going to read this out, there was some new news last week in the world of Minecraft. Minecraft came out and said that they were basically anti-blockchain and Web3. They said things to the effect of integration of NFTs with Minecraft are generally not something we will support or allow. They continued to say that while players have long been able to charge for access to private Minecraft servers, they control the company's usage guidelines stress that all players should have access to the same functionality in those servers. That's in conflict, and this is an article also that's being written, that's in conflict with the main point of NFTs. Digital ownership based on scarcity and exclusion. So there's this whole thing that's going on that just happened with a very large, well-known game that hundreds of millions of players have played for years. And they do not seem to be aligned with the world of Web3 and NFTs. So, Andrew. As someone who has been an investor in this space for so long, from a gaming perspective, has been in the weeds uh, in terms of building games and studios, talk to us about what you think this is all about. There has been this, as I said, this bifurcation, this misalignment between the gaming community and those in Web3. And so talk to us about what you think this Minecraft news is and what you think about how this is affecting the world of gaming. Uh, yeah, awesome. Great, great thing to talk about because it's so contemporary. Uh, just, just for a little more context on my background, uh, managing director at Transcend, have worked on about 60 games, totaling about five to six billion in revenue over my, my career as an operator. Uh, so I've built a lot of games, every platform, every genre, every audience, every distribution model, every monetization model for gaming. Um, what's really interesting to see, you know, gaming classically stratifies into technology, IP, and audience. And technology tends to get squeezed down either into a small number of service providers in a centralized world um, or into something that's fully integrated into one of the other two verticals, which is to say that like Microsoft is a bit of technology. It's also a lot of audience, right, uh, with Xbox. On the other side, for the gaming side, you end up with Hollywood Studios, 
uh, increasingly like Marvel, owning a lot of the footprint for eyeballs. In the case of Minecraft, you have both platform and an IP and a technology, sorry, and an audience, which is massive. You know, generationally one of the bigger franchises in gaming, without a doubt. And Microsoft, I think, even said this on their earnings call, they want to control the monetization. So you can imagine as an owner of a business, if you own all three pillars of a gaming ecosystem and it's effectively a walled garden, you do not want any leaks coming out of that ecosystem at all. And therein, I think, presents this really interesting opportunity for Web3, which is simply decentralization as a counterpoint to centralization presents pure, like perhaps the most extreme example of innovator's dilemma, right? For, for Microsoft with Minecraft, the marginal cost of opening the gates on their walled gardens are, whether it's real or not, perceived to be enormous. Right. So they'll be very slow to embrace decentralization. And that opens the door for folks like Genevieve and others to enter in and do <laughs> interesting things. Jen? To blow it up? <laughs> no, but um, it's actually really annoying, the Minecraft news, because I'm with a startup. We're on a very low budget. And land in Decentraland, right? I mean, it's like, you know, 5K to buy like a plot. So I actually had my twins, who are 10, build us a headquarters in Minecraft last week so that I could meet with my team, you know, in the metaverse. And uh, that didn't go so well. So now we've got this empty entertainment building. Um, but yeah, decentralization is key. Um, walled gardens are going to die. I mean, we've got 20 years. We're 5% you know, across that bridge to the metaverse, right? So I think that everyone can take their stance now. But we all know we're looking at the future. We're here today, right? So I'm with entertainment. Um, we help creators use fan and brand engagement utility NFTs to take stories into worlds. And let me break down really quickly what that means. So right now, when somebody makes a story, uh, a movie, for example, uh, Netflix will buy that. They'll immediately toss the creators off because everyone treats creators like crap. Then they'll go and they'll find a team, right? You know, like a producer, a director, it's a very small team. And they will take it over, over into a walled garden and they'll make a story. They'll go away in a room and then they'll come back and they'll give you a film, right? Maybe some minimal IP, and everything is tightly held and protected. Um, with Web3, we can blow that up. So when you come to entertainment.com, .live, .nft, we have all the domains. When you come to us, we will help you do collaborative world building with your fans. And so you can weave like different, uh, you know, fans, brands, etc., all the way through a creation process. Be it a game, be it a VR world, be it a, a movie or a story or anything. So when fans come to us, when creators come to us, we say, hey, how much do you want to raise? And they'll say uh, 250,000. And we'll say, great, okay, we're going to do a multi-tiered mint. And we walk them through how to weave everybody in. There's usually a small, medium, large way to engage your fans. Mm -hmm. Let's say at the bottom, like for 50 bucks, you know, somebody wants to buy a ticket to your show and a t-shirt, great, sell that. But at the middle, for 1,500 bucks, they might want to get their name in the credits, a selfie with the celebrities on the show. And then at the top, for 1,500 bucks, they might want to buy in as a associate producer. Why wouldn't you sell this if they want that? But that's just where it starts. So brands want to get involved. Vogue wants to sponsor your costumes. Uh, SoundCloud wants to sponsor your sound rigs. This is the future of advertising. And then the, the walls are breaking down. So um, some of our creators, including Gray Singh, we just did a Mint of Crash Punks, her, her animated series. They're selling roles into their show. They are selling uh, access access to the writer's room. So not just roles for you to be in the movie, but Grace has uh, you know, an NFT series. So what she did was she sold roles to people's crash punks, their avatars. So their avatars now hold IP. Yeah. And what she did was she's making this animated series. She's using AI to scan the facial features and expressions of the people that own the crash punk. She's overlaying that over the character in the animation, and then they're doing the voiceover. It's a whole new world. Yeah. So I think, as Paul alluded to in the onset, that there is a room full of here of people who are experienced in Web3, and there are people who are less experienced with Web3. Normie, so derogatory, Paul. Um, but we'll use the terminology, because <laughs> Paul said it. 
Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the history here. So from the traditional side, and Andrew obviously can allude to this, the history of traditional gaming started about 50 years ago, actually 50 years ago today with Pong in 1972. Oh. Um, as someone who actually has a original Pong console at my house, because I'm a geek like that, I can appreciate that. You had two little rolling things and you basically you know, had to try to you know, play against somebody else. And then over the last 50 years, you have a morphed into a large total addressable market of over 3 billion players around the world, just half, about half of the uh, total population of the world. In that time, you have seen the console wars of the late 80s into the 90s, and then you start to see this new burgeoning uh, side of things where things were all on the proverbial web. Things like Fortnite, things like Call of Duty, where you could download these things directly and, and start to play. What's happened on the other side of gaming with Web3? Let's talk about that. So you had 50 years of expansion. This is all during recessions, during wars, during obviously pandemics. Um, you had 50 years of expansion with traditional gaming. With Web3, many people typically look at around 2011, 2012 as the birth of blockchain-based gaming with games like Gambit. Um, this was something that if you are a newbie or normie, whatever you want to call it, thank you, Paul, you can look at Gambit, you can look at you know, some of the other games out there. They were effectively the similar approach to Atari 2600 back in the early 1980s, I should say 1880s almost. And so you had this new kind of branch of, of blockchain with gaming around 2011, 2012 with Gambit. For nothing happened for years. All of a sudden in 2017, you had the birth of CryptoKitties. Hopefully most of you by this point know what CryptoKitties are. Um, and then all of a sudden you had this new world of NFTs that kind of came into the world. 2018, you had the world of Axie start where you marry this idea of play to earn and blockchain-based gaming with NFTs. And now, you fast forward you know, four years after that, we are where, Andrew? Uh, you know, so if I could address that question by back, backtracking a bit. You know, one thing that Sam talked about in his speech, which I thought was really great, his talk, his, his Q&A, was this notion of, it was implied that dating apps are generational. And it's true for every consumer product without a doubt. You know, it's funny, like all the folks that go to business school, you know, we, everyone reads the case about Levi's and how they lost their relevance. Uh, you know, my view on that is that was inevitable, right? Like kids don't wear the stuff that their parents wear. That's just the way it is. And with dating apps, same thing. You know, if Gen A wants to get catfished in the metaverse, I don't understand it as Gen X, <laughs> but go, go to it, right? There's probably a business there. But uh, for gaming, um, there is a generational quality. And there's also a regional quality. What's happening right now as Web3 technology, uh, I think, st standardizes to some extent through consolidation. But also, the use cases become more clear and a little more mass market. Still a long way to go there, frankly. You're seeing regional adoption patterns that are very different, right? For example, a lot of the examples David spoke to were things that rose out of Asia, Southeast Asia, which is where a lot of gaming as a service rose as well. You could argue that Asia is the most advanced in terms of gaming as a service and would be the most likely to move to the next version of gaming, which is most certainly decentralized gaming. Whereas NFTs have been much more popular in what I would characterize as um, you know, first world countries with, uh, you know, it's nothing more lu luxurious than having a profile pic that costs a couple hundred thousand dollars, right? So our view is that gaming is regional again, that massive technology adoption in the Philippines where there are more wallets, uh, cons consumers have more wallets, more consumers have wallets than consumers had bank accounts, right? Same in, in Vietnam. Those places are where a lot of the real innovation for gaming is gonna happen. Like we've purposefully made small investments in Asia just to get that telemetry. And then on the other side of things, we think that uh, there's an interesting bifurcation happening between Asian IP owners, going back to the three pillars, for example, Square Enix with Final Fantasy actively testing whether they can move that IP into Web3 versus someone like Microsoft, which is what we started off with, saying, no, we're not going to go to Web3 at all. So I think there's innovation happening in pockets. And really, the best ideas are going to pull together the timing that Sam alluded to 
with the market opportunity and the technology and just bang it. And it's, in, it's interesting that you, you mentioned, you know, IP, because I'm learning this entire decentralization, you know, kind of, kind of bomb going off is all about IP. So we've all seen Netflix is struggling, right? Um, in fact, all of the streamers are struggling. Uh, we all binged way too much <laughs> during the pandemic. We're coming out of a pandemic. We're tired. We're going into a recession. We want to feel something again. Nobody wants another streamer. Nobody wants more contact, more content. We want to be part of something. And I think this is all hinging, frankly, on IP. So, so what we find so fascinating in entertainment is that it used to be with IP, again, it was a very tight world. Like you create Ghostbusters or you create Star Wars, and it's this very tightly held little group of people. And if anyone gets near the IP or infringes, you know, there's a knife's come out and they, they've got lawyers on you. That's all changing now. Thanks to wallets, we can track IP down 50 generations. Not only can you get something from the sale of an NFT, but you can set resales in that NFT. So if it's ever traded on OpenSea, you can get a cut back. So for us, what's so exciting is that, yes, we have people using us like Kickstarter. They come in and they're like, I want to raise 250. I got a story. I got everything. Fine. We will absolutely help you fundraise. But what's more exciting to me is that people are using entertainment like Dungeons and Dragons. So they're coming to us with an NFT collection or a game or a comic. And they're basically saying, I have a world, I have some rules, I have a premise, I have an OG character. And then they gather 30 more people and they're like, go. And what's wild is that it immediately takes off. Not only do you have the original IP holder right there, but they're selling. Here's the roles in the show, and those are snapped up. And then these three people that snapped up characters build subworlds around their characters. And then somebody buys the gaming rights, and someone buys the merch rights. Then the metaverse starts building. And it just goes on and on, but it's trackable across all the wallets. So 50 generations down, somebody buys something in the metaverse that you weren't even part of starting. You just started the animated series. Somebody buys something from the metaverse, and you can get a cut of that transaction all the way back up. So I think, I think we're about to see worlds become everything. You know, it used to be in Web 2 that you would have audiences facing a stage. Web 2.5 is chairs in a circle. It's a community with participants. But Web 3.0? That's, that's worlds with citizens, right? Where every move you make, butterfly affects around, it affects everyone else. It's, you know, it's similar to what I was hearing at NFT NYC this year. At, at Star Wars, this is great that you have a few original characters, but every stormtrooper has a story. Imagine if you could invite 100 people or 1,000 people to build out the stories of yeah. those stormtroopers. It's incredible. Yeah, David, just to, yeah. uh, like, probably a more specific answer to what you asked is, like, I do think this notion of DeFi becoming games is dead. Yes. Just yeah. to be direct, right? Like, we did not invest in projects like that because if anyone that does game design you go into the spreadsheets, you look at the design, it's not durable, right? The flip is, if you start more with the consumer use case, I really like Sam's framework. It's very, very close to the way we think at our fund as well. If you think about the audience, the use case, what are they trying to do with an entertainment experience online? And then pull back from that, you start to realize that decentralized gaming has been around for a bit. It's not reached its potential because Web3 technology didn't exist. So for example, Lineage, is an excellent example of a game that very early on had closed economic principles, in-game marketplace, people making tons of money, you know, building, uh, enchanting, evolving weapons that then became scarce and thus other people wanted them within the game. Uh, and then social structures all around that, perhaps some of the earliest examples of DAOs or EVE Online for that matter. Yep. But these, these games m didn't have the enabling technologies of Web3. So, my personal view is that type of approach is what takes us to the next, yeah. next level of gaming. People that build a game first and then find ways to decentralize it, whether it's at an IP level or a monetization level or an economic rights participation level, and then bring in the right subset of Web3 technologies to enable it, which is totally different, right? Like if your business model, similar to what Sam said, if you're starting with, well, we could use MetaMask, and then what product will we build next? That, I think for games, that doesn't quite work. Yep. Um, and we're getting close, so I'll open up uh, to questions in a second. But I think 
And some of the things that we've learned as well, too, from the venture perspective and being early uh, into play to earn into Web3 gaming, which I'm no longer using that phrase anymore. I'm just calling it gaming. I'm not, yeah, <laughs> just, just yeah, gaming. Yeah, yeah. gaming. Yeah, just gaming. Yeah, gaming. Um, what we've learned is that inflating token supplies don't work. Um, so we think, and we've seen from founders that they've learned that inflating token designs don't work. Dual token designs uh, were very prominent in a lot of these games over the last two years. That no longer really works. So we've learned through, unfortunately, failures and pain, which is part of tech. Innovation. Yep, that you know, there are things that don't work. And so that hopefully causes and creates new innovation that does work. Uh, so this whole world, and just to give you one last data point, I believe uh, there's been some study about Fortnite players. Uh, again, that's a Web2 game, but Fortnite players. I believe in totality since around 2017 when the game came out till now, five years, that roughly 10 billion hours of Fortnite have been played. Ooh. 10 billion hours. If you think that gaming is not going to innovate and is not going to capture parts of the world, especially with the innovation that's happening in Web3, good luck with that. Open up to questions. Uh, I got a microphone. Uh, if you look at like Web2 Gaming, right, every single MMO has an inflationary token or like in-game economy. So I'd be curious, like, if you're looking at to create like a Web3 game that's open economy with a live token, I don't think you cannot have it be inflationary. Um, but I think the argument is, or at least in my opinion, there's not a game that's developed far enough where they have the proper like inputs and outputs like if you look at axie right they're still in their alpha um and so i'd be curious to see like on your opinion why inflationary tokens are, are already disproven in the web3 space uh perhaps i'll take that uh so in web2 yes definitely and web web1 frankly there are definitely examples of games that have inflationary economies um the key difference is the there's a monopoly on the, the creation of assets for the game and also on the roadmap for the game, right? In other words, the designer makes money off selling in-game items. They determine the roadmap on their own. And usually they determine the roadmap in response to what their revenue targets and profit objectives are. So when you, and I've seen, anyone that's worked on the game side, you know, not to name names of companies specifically that might have done this, um, like if you break an economy in Web 2, you just junk it. You're like, oh, this loop is now broken because it's imbalanced. Or you create some way to nerf it. And the thing with decentralization is you can't do that because you'd be nerfing something that somebody paid for and that they own. What's nerfing? Uh, sorry, yeah, great. <laughs> My bad. Uh, it's, it's a nerf gun. You just yeah, shoot people. True. <laughs> interesting, in, interesting note on nerf. They had this gel gun that was Asian innovation. Like, it's, it's super cool. I, I actually want to get one of these. But <laughs> nerf is like, it's soft. You blunt it. You, you make it weaker, right? So you take a sword that was metal and powerful and you turn it into a nerf sword that's worthless. And that, that's the concept of nerfing. And one, one quick uh, response to that, too, is that in games in Web3, especially Axie, um, you saw those, uh, as Andrew alluded to, especially in the Philippines, uh, during the height of SLP and Axie, that were effectively making anywhere between $200 to $500 USD per month by playing grinding on that game. But what were they doing with that? They were off-ramping. They were paying for food. They were paying for clothing. They were effectively using it uh, during the height of COVID because they were unemployed. And so when you have one of the features of off-ramping, you know, basically you are playing, you have sweat equity, you have now won, or you have a labor and a wage associated with that. You can't, you know, necessarily just keep that employee or that, you know, that laborer in the economy. You have to give them a way to off-ramp. And so with off-ramps, you know, if you have continuous inflation, uh, that, to that currency obviously starts to depreciate. So we believe that amortizing um, is really the way forward. We believe that burn mechanisms need to be further improved. We need to you know, have more utilization of the token. Uh, if you have a game out there, that token needs to be used for XP, for power-ups, for more artifacts. Um, it needs to actually have utilization beyond just obviously off-ramping. 
On the note of tokens, uh, I just for, for everyone in the room that loves NFTs, um, entertainment has a POAP token for today. We have 98 left. Come see us at our table. We have lots of swag and fun stuff. If you need help opening a wallet to get your POAP token, we can walk you straight through that. And um, I'm here with Eighth Light, the best development firm in Chicago. I use them with Sitter City. I use them with entertainment. So they're also offering a few free development hours for any builders in the room that want to want to come on in and check them out but come get our token it's really fun and just a quick disclaimer i want to make sure um this is not investment advice <laughs> although it will be worth a lot later uh there's a few other questions yeah uh, great panel discussion i have two quick questions sure. so i've played with a lot of metaverses and games so currently like user own assets the interoperability is on a 2D level, depending on the metaverse, if it's high fidelity, low fidelity, you can't integrate 3D assets there. That's the first, like what are the, some standards on that side? And second is around ethics and incentive design, so drawing analogy to Terra Luna. Mm. A lot of like this uh, uh, gaming, like um, play to earn, move to earn, if you have aggressive incentives, like it's not sustainable and at some point, they're going to face that challenge. So thoughts on what are uh, some good incentives? I'll quickly address the interoperability side of things. And we actually have a founder here um, who uh, is building just for that. Um, uh, if you find um, the folks from Spaceport, uh, they are addressing that specific issue right now. Uh, one of the things that we found, to your point, you have games based in Solana. You have games in Ethereum. You have games in Flow and Avalanche. Um, the assets need to be able to talk to each other. You need to be able to bring a sword from Solana's game into potentially a game on AVAX. Um, and the interoperability of that doesn't work. And for those, you know, just to kind of, you know, quickly, you know, make uh, interoperability ELI5, if you will, like, explain it to me like I'm five for those that don't really appreciate it. If you have a Yahoo email and you send something to me and I'm using my Gmail, it works. And then I send it back to you and we're talking and we're communicating. That's interoperability. Two different, you know, obviously companies, two different servers, two different types of protocols, but they work. That's what we're talking about, is having, you know, different uh, layer one blockchains, different assets, being able to work together, be able to talk to each other, and be able to harmoniously create something really interesting and fun. Um, I do think it's, an, it's, an, it's a need and it's an opportunity. It's unclear to me whether it gets solved at an engine level, like by Epic, for example, with Unreal or if it gets solved at a protocol level with like a new type of smart contract that allows for attributes that are not currently embedded in the standard smart contracts for NFTs to permeate across chains, or if it's something that needs to be solved through a service provider. Um, my personal interest right now is trying to find the killer app for gaming. That's kind of what we're focused on. Xbox would not be what it is without Halo. On the, um, on the uh, ethics side, you know, this is something that I think we're, we'll all have to grapple with outside of games, right? With, in a decentralized world, there is a potential for things to go dystopic. Um, and there's also a potential for, um, you know, people that play a very short-term game to win, right? And, and so I do think regulation, personally, is necessary uh, you to, worried about to achieve that. Ready Player One future. <laughs> uh, there's a big oasis with a yeah, uh, overlord. Not, <laughs> not, I personally, not so much. I, I'm actually much more worried about, um, and there are early signs of this, about decentralization being uh, a false narrative. Yeah. We've got a few more questions. Where do you see yeah. oh, uh, <laughs> Thanks. Right behind you. Yeah, thanks. Um, I feel like a lot of gamers have a negative perspective on NFTs and gaming. Yep. So how are corporations going to bridge that and get into this, but also like not, you know, make their gamers, you know, so up in arms? I, I like to kind of reference this question because it's not the first time we addressed, obviously, with the, the Minecraft and NFT kind of quote unquote ban earlier. Um, back in 2016, I was in a room full of family office investors who were doing real estate and public equity and doing absolute return funds and doing things, you know, typically in an endowment model. I'm talking about Bitcoin and Ethereum and talking about you know, new identity regimes. And they thought I was crazy and they wanted me out of the room. Um, and so that happened for years. And so this is what typically we see is that you have you know, people that have been participating in legacy frameworks for decades. 
you know, gamers are very, very strident. They're close-knit. Um, they don't trust big corps. Um, and so naturally, you know, they say, okay, oh, you're going to create, you know, 50,000 of these scarce assets, and we're all going to buy them. But do we really trust that you're not going to just, you create another 150,000 of these, you know, in two weeks after you sell them all out? Do we really trust that? Have you, have you burned us before? And so there's a lot of mistrust uh, between the gamer community and obviously new potential corps out there like Microsoft and you know, all the other ones out there. We saw that with Ubisoft. They got slaughtered because there's a huge mistrust. That's going to take some time. There's also been clumsiness around the implementation of NFTs. They are about access. That's it. They are badging for access. And so we, we're not seeing any, anyone being upset. Everyone loves how we're using them, right? But if you use them wrong, like if you decide to slap an NFT on something to see what happens, it, it's going to go badly. You have to use it about, around badging and access. And I would say just very quickly, um, I don't know. Raise a quick hand. How many people have kids here? How many of them play Fortnite? You've all had to play for V-Bucks. You've all had to do that. <laughs> Guess what happens when they stop playing the game and you spend $200 <laughs> on those skins? You don't own them. And that was one of my kind of catalysts is that, you know, you spend, you, you have sweat equity, you have all of this. And that's a, that's a, a, a dialogue that is yet to really happen yet in the gamer community is that they don't understand, to, to Jen's point, is that if you have sweat equity, if you put 200 hours into a game and you've XP and you have power-ups and you have this new skin that's completely scarce and, and no one else has it, and you can own it, and then guess what? If you get tired of it in two months, you can go to OpenSea and sell it for money. That doesn't under, they don't get that yet, and it's going to take time. Just curious your take on, on Roblox and that as a platform and where this goes. You guys want to well, we're building a new headquarters in Roblox right now. <laughs> Literally, we, we need like a free metaverse headquarters. Like other worlds, expensive, and you know, I don't know. So hopefully, they won't do what Minecraft just did. I do, I do, I do think uh, Roblox is one of the first examples of a centralized metaverse. Uh, yes, I had a question about um, gamifying behaviors. I'm with Chiral Health, the healthcare space. How do you see a business opportunity for gamifying, for example, uh, health, wellness, fitness? Oh, I love this um, question. It's kind of a blend of Web it. 2 yeah. and 3. Yeah. Um, funny enough, in two, I think around 2018, 2019, I used Medium to write some blogs. And I actually, I did an Isaac Asimov type of thing where I projected out to 2053. And I said, OK, what do we see right now in terms of the kind of the L1s and the apps that we have right now? What, is that, you know, what could that look like? And you know, with sensors and with health, you know, whoop and everything else like that, imagine the capacity. You see this with Stepin right now. Imagine the capacity to be proactive with your health, to be able to measure your steps, to be able to measure your calories burned, to measure your activity, your exercise, and be able to then permit, you know, have permission, you know, between you know, using something like a zk proof, where your your data is protected and, and kind of encapsulated, or something like Secret Network, because I know they're hanging out here today too. And then imagine having that going to your insurance company. So instead of paying X, they're now saying, oh, wow, you're really being good about your health. You're proactive. You're running. You're exercising. You're, you're keeping in shape. We're going to lower that now to the lowest possible you know, premium right now because you are really healthy and you're really active. That, I think, is something that is immense. And I think that is a very big possibility in the near-term future. Uh, for game, gamification in particular, like it does feel like uh, one of the nice things about, similar to DeFi, going in, trying to become a game, I think there are elements of gaming that can be applied to other categories, but it really has to fit. It has to fit the, the design. To go back to Sam's stuff with dating, like a leaderboard for dating is probably not a good game design, right? <laughs> Maybe for some people, but for everyone that's not number one, that might be kind of bad. So, you know, you just have to pick and choose. You have to be thoughtful. Uh, I, I definitely, that would not be good. Um, yeah. Sure, go ahead. So I have a, a very different question. How do you see uh, real world problem solving like childcare through Web3 and uh, especially you, are, uh, you have founded Setter City. So how do you see Setter City in Web3 world? What's your take? 
How funny. I honestly haven't thought much about it. I mean, I, we sold Sitter City to Bright Horizons three years ago, uh, and it was a great company. You know, we, we raised 70 million, we served 10 million users. I would say that at Sitter City, our biggest concern was building out on demand. We had Chime, we built out Chime in the last six years there, and we desperately tried to make the Uber of childcare, right? Because right now, Sitter City's like the match.com of childcare. So you go in, you post a job, et cetera. We we had managed to get Chime working in a few cities, and then we realized that Bright Horizons really valued our corporate side, Bright, which we serve thousands of companies, the U.S. Department of Defense, they, they wanted that. So because we knew we were headed there, we partnered with them for 10 years, we had to kind of shut down on demand, and I'm just concerned we never made on-demand work, because we need the lift of childcare. So somebody come find me. If you want to build that, I feel tortured. Come come find me. Now I am under NDA because for five years I'm under lock up with Bright Horizons, but I can tell you some stuff. Like I can walk you through some stuff. Yes, eventually we'll have POET badging as well, probably for sitters or, or uh, for us badging with Sitter City was always about CPR, first aid or things like that. And that's, we can play with that too. But um, I would say right now, we, we never even made on-demand work there, and that's the model I want to see somebody solve, so find me, we'll talk. Let's, yeah, let's fix this, love it. Well, thank you all. Thank you to our amazing panel, uh, absolutely amazing.